day, it's Thursday, it's Sports Stars de la e, and that means it's time for Sports Stars Football, our weekly look at all matters regarding the big ball, both in Ireland and Australia. You might have heard, if you were listening to Sports Stars Camogie yesterday, that we are wrapping up that series for the next month. We can assure you Sports Stars Football is going to continue on, not in the same format that we're using at the moment. We'll be focusing totally on Australia over the next four weeks as we look forward to the preliminary semi-finals and the playoffs of the AFLW but Sports Stars Football will be returning back in its current guise by the end of April early May hopefully a green light on matches will be known by then our guest today later on will be hearing from the Intermediate Players Player of the Year Vicky Wall from Mead will be talking about player pathway hoping to get a crack at Dublin and Leinster Senior Championship and that interview in TG Cahar uh, also coming up Joanne Dunn will be here to preview the final round of group games or round games whatever you call them in Australia we know five of the six qualifiers who will take the last spot we will go through that later on so all that and much more but first let's go through the news that we have in football this week well, former LGFA President Marie Hickey has done an interview with the Leash Nationalist and saying she's no plans to take it easy and she'll still be involved in the National Committee and I have no doubt she'll continue to make a contribution towards the LGFA. If you didn't hear Sports Stars Football last week, the 18th of March, the new President Michal Nocton was our guest and we talked an awful lot about his hopes but also the main talking points affecting um games in general so check that out if you haven't an interesting interview with Owen Cormick and the Irish Examiner with the new Camogie uh, president still president elect but uh, become Camogie president next month Hilda Breslin and we didn't have this information in sports stats Camogie but she has said she's in favour of the merger of the GEA the LGFA and the Camogie Association very very interesting a lot of players looking for that at the moment and understandably so after some incidents that have taken place in recent times but then again we've had people talking the other side of things that it won't necessarily sort all the problems out i think that's a story that's going to um dominate an awful lot of chat in 2021 and probably 2022 as well but hilda breslin we are hoping to talk to her on our show when we come back in may has said she is in favor of the merger Interesting news. Just talking about LGFA, plenty of webinars going on. We just want to make sure you're aware that they are happening, especially while we're still waiting for games to come back in Ireland. Plenty to um, be going out there, get trained, get qualified up. And just while I think of it too, great news that and the GA have sanctioned the North of Ireland's ease of restrictions and club players in the six counties. And Derry, Down, Antrim, Armagh, Tyrone and Fermanagh can go back training on April the 12th. Um, now, that's no inter-county training is allowed. No games are permitted at the moment, but they can get back out on the field, which is brilliant news. We'll be asking Joanne Doonan about that later on. Of course, Joanne, All-Ireland winner with Fermanagh. No news what's happening in the South yet. We probably won't know till next week. There's been rumours flying around that GA have met Netflix and decisions have been made to have completely ruled that out. That has not happened. So we just have to sit and wait until next week. We could have news any time from next Tuesday what's happening in the South. And once we know what's happening in the 26 counties, it might give us a clear picture of how it's going to affect everyone all over the island of Ireland. Uh, going back to LGFA, six-week food series with Sinead Delahunty is starting up as part of their Gaelic for Teens programme. Um, nutrition, very, very important now for the modern athletes. So I'd encourage anybody playing or anybody who's a parent of a player to uh, watch that series and um, see what you think of it as well and might pick up some new ideas as well. Uh, let's move on. We mentioned Vicky Wall. She was at the launch of the Player Pathway Programme in conjunction with the GEA, the LGFA and the Camogie Association last week. She talked to Assemble Media afterwards, including sports stars. We asked her about AFLW, Player Pathway, um, hoping to play against uh, Dublin this year. She also answered questions about that interview uh, with TG Carr, where she talked about uh, abuse she got over her weight. That's simple as that. Shocking that that attitude is still out there. Um, and 
the response has been tremendous and the live of Vicky has been so she'll be talking about that as well that is coming up very very shortly and while we're talking about Mead LGFA they have a new van Keypack have supplied them a van they are starting as they mean to continue acting like all Ireland champions acting like a senior team and we look forward to seeing the Mead ladies football fans sponsored by Keypack out on the road in the not too distant future Another team we're looking forward to seeing very, very soon, whether it happens this year or not, is Kilkenny Football. They've had their, they've elected their new county board, their meeting was a success, and it looks like that Kilkenny Ladies Football is back on course, and it won't be too long before they return to action. Of course, we look think of Kilkenny, we think of Hurlan, we think of Camogie, they are the All-Ireland Camogie champions, but... Look, it, it, for those footballers in the county too and a very passionate football base as well so hopefully uh, it looks like we're going to see them back soon and that is absolutely tremendous news uh, the new series of Lacra Gale and TG Carr starts tonight Breach Corkery will be a guest in an upcoming episode I think it's in two weeks time Breach, of course, multi-time All-Ireland winner at both Camogie and Ladies Football. Should be a fascinating show. You might remember that Corona headband back in 2006. If you have not got a clue what I'm talking about, then make sure you check out Lacra Gale on TG Car when Breach Corkery is on. Um, very, very interesting story, especially just 15 years ago. Do you want to win a vintage 1967 Massey Ferguson tractor? Well, if you do, Garnish GA in Cork, home of Anya Terry O'Sullivan, um, can give you the opportunity. That's their fundraiser, a novel idea. I don't know much more about it myself, but I'm sure if you go on social media, you won't find it too hard to check it out. Garnish GA now, I'm saying. Uh, check out their social media pages. And who knows, maybe coming into the summer with long evenings and a bit of time, you could have a vintage 1967 Massey Ferguson, whether you want it for display or want to use it. A brilliant idea, and of course there's been some great novel fundraising ideas. Uh, we'd love to go talk to people about them all, but it's it's no different to kids in a schoolroom. You know, you do one, you have to do them all, and we wouldn't have the time, but we'll always make sure we plug as many events as we can, and we've done that here on the Sports Stats podcast since we have returned in January. We mentioned last week that Sinead Burke, um, Galway GA player, has announced her retirement, and we wish Sinead the very, very best of luck. Roscommon LGFA have a a new virtual event coming up 5k for us common lgfa uh, running over easter weekend uh check that out as well how you can support i think um people are pledging and denominating people as well so you could find yourself nominated into it too but that is what's common 5k for us common lgfa they've been doing tremendous work uh promoting their sport uh since the, lo- the lockdown 3.0 commenced and finally, before we finish up, East Belfast are looking for coaches. You might remember when we started off with Sports Stars, Colleen Duffy did a great feature on the new East Belfast Club. And they go from strength to strength. And if you're interested in getting involved from anywhere or nearby there, check out their pages as well to find out how you can come in as a coach for 2021. So that's all the news regarding Gaelic football for the week. Coming up later on, Joanne Doonan will be with us as we preview round nine of the AFL Women's Series as we start to find out what six teams are going to compete in the playoffs over the three weeks that come after that. But coming up after the break, we hear from Mead football star Ficky Wall, who was at the recent launch of the Player Pathway Programme, and she spoke to me and Assemble Media at that event. I like listening to Sports Dad because he has famous celebrities and I guess listen to him. Darren Kelly. Mead All Ireland winner and 2020 Intermediate Players Player of the Year, Ficky Wall, was recently at the launch of the new Player Pathway Programme in conjunction with the GEA, LGFA, and the Camogie Association. Afterwards, she challenged to assemble media, including Sports Dad, and first I asked her about the AFLW and had she been following it this year? Yeah. I think it's unbelievable that TG got her in um, all, all the media on it and I suppose even just sitting down and watching a few of the highlights it's, it's nice to see it's probably it's nice to see a bit of live sport and to see people you would have played with in college or played against so yeah it's, it's been really nice We talked about of course it's great having me back in senior football and hopefully you get to dance with the Dubs in the Leinster final at some stage during the year I was in Turles that day when the game against Cork in 2015 and Mead of course were not the great sell so far so you must be delighted we talked after the All-Ireland final but you must be delighted 
to see where Mead football is in general, not just the fact that you are All-Ireland champions. Yeah, that court game has been coming up to haunt me now the last few weeks in these interviews. So it's, uh, yeah, we lost by 40 points and it was definitely one of the lowest points and I've been playing with Mead. But yeah, to get back where we are and to, you know, after the, the heartache that we've had, and I think that was probably something that drove us on the last few years. We've had, a, we just still have a few girls playing now that would have been playing against Cork. So it's big improvements and to see the improvements in the last few years is, is, is huge. And final one for me, Vicky. Sarah, of course, had an injury that day in Crow Park. Serious injury too. How is she at the moment and is she any chance of playing football in 2021? Um, well, has anyone a chance of playing football? You know, we don't know that yet. So she's not working back to a specific goal as such at the moment. But yeah, look, it was tough. She got her, that's her second time doing the ACL. And, you know, I saw the mental work she put in the first time. It took her nearly nine, ten months to get back. So look, it's, it's a tough task. So I think she's just focusing on herself and getting back walking properly and running properly rather than uh, thinking about football at the moment. But yeah, she's on the road for recovery anyway. Going back to the Royal County's current fortunes, Vicky discusses how they've been getting on since the All-Ireland final win over Westmead and the hope of facing Dublin this year. Yeah, the last couple months have been really good. You know, we were delighted to finally get the win to get up to senior. Yeah, I think it definitely is different. We're not naive in the fact that we have big challenges ahead against us this year. You know, if the provincial goes ahead, it will be playing a straight final against Dublin. So, look, you're playing against senior All-Ireland champions, first ma- possible first match. So, we're not naive and we know that we have to, I suppose, increase physicality and strength. So, yeah, I suppose preparations will be a bit different. We kind of want to be playing against the best and that's been our goal since we kind of got relegated to intermediate a few years ago. So we're happy to be back up playing against the best. I think if we were to admit it to ourselves in 2018 when we were playing against Tyrone, if we'd gone up senior, you know, I probably would have questioned how we would have survived. But we've got a few more years experience and under our belts now. And <clears throat> I'd be more confident in the fact that we can compete up with senior and probably hold our own. And we don't want to be coming up to go straight back down. So I think definitely we're a lot more confident uh, this year, yeah. Upon winning the Player of the Year award, Vicky spoke about verbal abuse directed towards her because of her weight and the response she got from that interview on TG Cahar. Yeah, definitely a huge amount of thought. It was something I'd said, yeah, look, I'll bring it up in the interview, but I definitely think, didn't expect the reaction it's gotten so far. Um, I'm overwhelmed by it, but I also think it's it's uh, been really encouraging in the fact that a lot of even younger girls maybe that have reached out to me and maybe the fact that I didn't realise that like I obviously do realise it's a problem, but I think the fact that people have reached out to me with similar stories, I suppose, look at them, having a bit of extra um, conversation about the topic is definitely not a bad thing. And it's Cash 22, you're kind of saying, do you just ignore them and make them kind of just let, let it fizzle out or do you, like you, know, like you say, tackle it head on? So I think it is trying to find that happy medium of how to approach it. I reflected on it. I think if I didn't have such a love for the game and I wasn't kind of, I did have that underlying confidence in myself that I definitely do think it could have gone a different way. I think it probably, when I look back, it probably did affect me a lot more than I would have liked to admit at the time. So, yeah, I definitely do think that the, the strong love I had for the game definitely helped. But I do think it did affect me, yeah. I have got a few parents that have said that it kind of shocked me that how young maybe it is. Players maybe under 12 and 14 and it's probably something that at that age I wouldn't definitely wouldn't have even been conscious of doing that kind of way. So I think it's definitely trickling down into younger ages. So I think maybe a bit more conversation and a bit more awareness about the topic definitely is a good thing. I kind of hadn't really thought of like, you know, strategically how you'd kind of tackle it. I think it is tough and I think stuff gets said at matches. No, it's perfect. Like, when you're under pressure or when you're high pressure situation like that and you're, you'd want your team to win and stuff I, I, I understand that stuff gets said so I don't know I don't think I have a, a perfect dance for it I do just think more talking about it and more acknowledgement that it's not okay maybe is a way forward and I think the fact that maybe more people are kind of coming out and talking about it and it's definitely not just in the female side of things I know it's, it's relevant to the male thing as well and maybe just a bit more about body image as a whole maybe to do with GA and stuff like that I've seen a few more articles this week so I think maybe the starting point is just the awareness side of things and finally can the player pathway program keep players in the game and change the mindset from just about winning yeah from a personal point of view anyway and I think players as a whole it's definitely positive I think seeing the three organisations work together on this player pathway is huge and I think it kind of is a, it's, a, it's positive and it's an encouraging sign to see the three organisations working together and I think the fact that the player pathway focus is so strongly on the club is a huge part and I know that like it's more so people that drop away from club rather than county at that age I think um, and especially with women maybe between the 16s and 17s is pivotal age so I think the fact that we're focusing on club and when you go in as a male or a female now underage in the nursery that you can see a clear clear pathway that's equal to both I think that will hopefully maybe tackle a bit of the retention issues. I like listening sports says because 
I like to listen to Ladies Football and Ladies Kamogi. Now I'm delighted to be joined by Joanne Doonan as we get ready for the final round of, I don't know, Joanne, if we call them group games in the AFL <laughs> Women's, but it's the final round Robin series. Picture is finally starting to take real shape. And at, by Sunday morning in our time, we're going to know who's in the playoffs. Yeah, I think exactly the last few weeks, you know, it's really been a, a fight for, I suppose, the top, uh, oh, well, I suppose them kind of third, fourth, fifth and sixth positions. And now I think we're a lot clearer on, I suppose, uh, the top four or five. It's really down to the last place and it's definitely going to be in for an interesting weekend. But I think at least four teams contending for that one spot. So um, it really is something to be looking forward to, definitely. We're going to talk to you about that in a second, but just to deal with the good news we have at home, for yourself in particular, and for many players in Ulster now, finally going to get back kicking the ball in a couple of weeks. I know, brilliant to hear that the green light has been given to the club players, I suppose. And the one probably good thing that came out of last year is that we did have that opportunity that you were just solely playing club. You know, you weren't mixing between club and county. And I actually really enjoy it. Uh, I personally enjoyed not feeling that you're, you know, you're splitting yourself into trying to, I suppose, keep everybody happy. So really delighted to to hear that we, we could be back out and pitch uh, sooner rather than later. And please God, that'll be it now and there'll be no stop and start and that'll be us for good. But no, I'm staying positive at this time. <laughs> uh, but it's brilliant news. It's long waited too that she, players yeah. are going to be out playing or playing Camogie for that matter too. And whether it ends up in club or county, I'm uh, sure when we know what's going on in the South and probably the next week or two, that picture mm-hmm. will become clearer then. But as you just touched on as well, it's the first sign we've had. Like we didn't take a being near the end of this, Joanne, that we started yeah. talking about this. It's the first sign we, we've had that some form of normality is coming back to Irish football. Yeah, 100%. Uh, um, and funny, I was getting notifications on the phone of, uh, it was this week we actually flew back from Australia last year, you know, so it has been, and I know everybody's talking about nearly like a full year in lockdown and or over a full year in lockdown. And I know it's kind of been broke out and I suppose like we've had breaks and whatnot, but uh, it's definitely some... Positive news for a change, especially over the uh, in twenty twenty one. Anyway, there hasn't been too much of it, so um, I think everybody's welcoming it with open arms. Thank God. And it'd be great to see it back. The first sign of action happening here. But of course, we'll be talking about you, if not to you, when all that <laughs> kicks off and uh, goes to, to the time. But uh, back to Australia. And we've marveled at some great games over the eight weeks we've seen so far. Uh, last week, we had nine teams competing for six spots. We might have known the three of them were effectively there, but nobody was mathematically over the line. Now, five places have been sealed. There was some amazing results the Dockers against the Demons come to mind mm-hmm. and now as you mentioned already there's four teams going for one final spot yeah exactly yeah I think we'll we'll probably have a few agreements on the, the game of the week but yeah definitely some some massive uh, wins for the weekend and a few yes maybe predicted and a few kind of have held teams in that we probably may have wrote off a wee bit earlier but looking at the ladder it's it's exciting you know you have the likes of Carlton Western Bulldogs and the Giants all fighting on 16 uh, points there and I suppose whatever way it goes the weekend even if two of them get a win it still comes down to percentages so to to know you might have missed out in the final spot just because of a, a few points here or there is definitely tough to take for certain teams but it'll be exciting now to see how it'll end up over the weekend if you haven't been looking at the uh, ladder on sportsstats.ie, we can confirm now that the Fremantle Dockers, the Brisbane Lions, the Collingwood Magpies, the Adelaide Crows and the Melbourne Demons are true. We'll talk about the game of the week at the moment. We're definitely, I think we're in uh, both in agreement on that. But, so we're down out to four teams. We're down to the North Melbourne Kangaroos. They're on five wins Five and three, yeah. as they say in Australia. And then, as you mentioned, the three teams on 16 points, the Western Bulldogs, Square Western Sydney Giants and Carlton. But you are looking at the percentages and likely margins you could get. This really comes down, in my opinion anyway, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, between the Kangaroos and Carlton. Yes, personally, like if you even look at, I suppose, the games that are coming ahead this weekend and I suppose, like you said, the percentages that Carlton are that way, but more considerably ahead of the likes of Western Bulldogs and the Giants that you'd be thinking it would be between them two but look if the Kangaroos don't win 
and maybe the Giants or the Bulldogs get a get a massive win. You know, it's very hard to know what way it, it could go. But again, you'd be looking with Carlton playing GWS as well. Like you'd you like to think that Carlton may come out of that one on top and the Ruse, I suppose, have probably won the toughest um last games, but uh with Frio, I suppose, being safe. And I suppose North having a lot more to play for than them, you might think, kind of be thinking that they may tip it. But again, Bulldogs, they've a, a game against Richmond and the way they've been playing this year, I know they haven't been winning the last few games. You know, they're, I think, three in a row having lost. But you'd like to think that they, they would like to push on and give it their best shot anyway for the last game. They'll be setting the tone on Friday when they take on Richmond. We'll talk about that in a while. But, of course, for those who are not familiar in the AFL women, it's about percentages, which is the score for divided by the score against. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, for example, uh, a 50 points to nil will work out better than a 60 points to 10 and things like that. And the Kangaroos are at the moment on 147.3%. So they have to take them right, a, a real hiding to go much below that. Of course, if they get any result, against the Dockers they're true but if they don't Joanne like the Bulldogs could be in the mix of the beat Richmond it sets us up for a cracker on Sunday between the Giants and Carlton yeah 100% and I suppose both teams coming in after win after the weekend and Carlton probably getting their percentage well up I think they were record breaking score at the weekend against the Suns um, but again like even looking like Suns did uh, score a lot against Carlton and probably more than I thought they would have scored but likewise still really had their, their percentage gains and maybe GWS might be looking at the last game thinking you know especially against G Long they should have been kind of getting that margin a wee bit higher but It'll be a tough match for, for Giants to kind of come out on top and put that marker down. But again, some of the games that went Carlton's way this year, you know, have been or went against Carlton's way, I wouldn't have said. So, um, but I, I definitely think that, you know, when it comes, when push comes to shoves, that Carlton kind of have that experience there and have them players that will kind of get them over that line. But definitely, again, I'm really looking forward to this weekend. It's all still to play for. It's set up nicely. They're the two games we're going to be focusing on in a few minutes. We better go back and tie up last week first. And seeing you mentioned it, we'll start with that. A couple of big contenders. I think there's one favourite for a match of the week. Yeah, I think we'll probably both agree the the Frio Melbourne game. And uh, I think we were chatting beforehand about it was literally edge of seat stuff, like coming towards the end and uh, the last quarter, last five minutes basically was, in my personal opinion, if Rio had to rob it, it would have been a, a steal for them after Melbourne leading the whole game. And even the likes, like even Lauren and Goalie have a massive performances and even to mention Goalie, I think it was Gemma Hutton she was, or Hutton she was um, marking and as soon as Goalie came off, the girl she was marking got two marks and inside 50s and two chances at goal. So, it's a credit to her performance and keeping her quiet up until that. Like so, you probably don't realize the influence girls have until um I suppose like that you see them come off them. But yeah, again, still the likes of North's game was still. I think we were a wee bit disappointed, and they might be a wee bit disappointed. Brisbane just seemed to be uh, the better team, but it was still a very good game to watch. And you, you might have thought that they could have come back, but uh, I think for you and Melbourne was definitely the game of the week. I can't argue with that. It was still that we've seen some crackers over the course of the campaign, like the two Melbournes collided, Carlton against the Dockers the week beforehand. But it was the first game where I was on the edge of my seat, <laughs> as you mentioned, your Gemma Houghton, like it's such a comeback from twenty-eight one down to get back yeah. and get in front. Of in Madison Gay, Gay with the winning score as well and it put the demons through because we both felt that the demons were going to be very vulnerable going into this final round if they hadn't already secured their ticket Yeah 100% and I suppose even the way the, the, the last goal came about was from a, a penalty a 50 metre penalty against Frio that brought it into that kind of shooting range and I suppose left it a wee bit easier for Melbourne to get that winning score which like you said, if they hadn't have got that win, I don't think it would have affected Freo as much, but uh, Daphne Melbourne would have been, I suppose, one of the teams that we're discussing that could could miss out. But Ark knows it's great to see that the hard workers to Daphne have a, a very good squad and the, the do show glimpses of how well they can play. And maybe, like you said, early in the season, they had a few losses, but they've definitely seen the learn from that and kind of come stronger together through it. So they're definitely still a team to be reckoned with within the final uh, six. 
All the highlights and results are up on sportstest.ie in our weekend results. If you haven't been watching them, just check out the highlights of the Dockers against the Demons or if you recorded TG Carr last week, watch it out in full as well. And there's some other great ones as well. Carlton's record score, Brisbane against Kangaroos that Joanne mentioned, even Richmond Tigers against West Coast Eagles yeah. that we touched on last week was like the, the B final. Of, forgive the clubs for saying that. Your moment of the week. My moment of the week actually was in the, the West Coast game. Um, it was probably just regarding the, the conditions I was there. And I think Neve Kelly maybe not won the one. Oh, you wouldn't in this class or as a, a massive player really tall. So I think it was her mark. It was only in the first quarter, but she kind of came out of nowhere and got this mark over uh, a few girls head. And just because the conditions, it was raining and everything. And she just secured it so well. And I think she kind of came back down onto her back, but it was, it was definitely a moment uh, that I kind of stood out to me uh, when I talked back at the games. And again, like I said, because it was it was a good game and I think she just gave it all. That It was definitely a standout. She's been really on fire since she came back from injury. Like poor Neve has been so unlucky with injuries and like that finger injury she got, I think it was round two. You know, you really yeah. were worried for her, like her confidence yeah. as much as the injury. But yeah. in the last couple of weeks, she's been knocking it out of the park. Completely fearless, yeah. Like, like you said, there's always that kind of I suppose risk when you come back from injury that you are worried about getting injured again and it's nearly the worst thing you can do. Um, but yeah, like you said, her each week her performance has just increased and like that, her confidence going up with it as well. And I think you can see that they're starting to gel a lot better as a team and her and Grace and even Ash linked up really well and even with the other players. Uh, that she's definitely putting her, her marker down to be one of the main players for West Coast this year. And now that we're talking about players, let's move on to player of the week. A lot of contenders this week. Yeah, 100%. Like you see the return of Sarah Rowe and massive influence for Collingwood's win. Even Orla Dwyer again over North Melbourne, which is a fantastic team. But I think I'm probably going to, and probably maybe not one up there, but I think Sinead Goldrick's influence is probably sometimes unrecognisable. And it's, it's similar to Gaelic in in ways that sometimes the forwards do get a lot of credit and a lot of say, points. Or if you're around the midfield, you know, you can get a lot of disposals that will bring your points up as well. That maybe sometimes doesn't isn't a fair reflection on how well the likes of Goalie or Lauren or whoever Aileen playing in the back can keep a massive forward quiet. And uh, I think after Goalie unfortunately went off injured, we kind of seen the influence she was having on the game and, on Freo's one of the, one of the best fours that they do have, um, and how I suppose she didn't really have much of an influence until uh, Sinead did go off. So uh, I definitely think she's deserving this week. Sinead Goldrake is Joanne's pick for this week. For me, as you mentioned, you named some of the players there already um, that could have been in the mix, likes of Neve and uh, Grace, uh, Sarah, Rowe, Orla, Dwyer too. But while their team performance wouldn't have been as good as they hoped, it was a low-scoring contest. The supply going to the attack was limited enough. Again, Scora, as we call her now, has stepped up again with a crucial goal, 10 possessions as well. And with the game that was in it and, you know... I how important the result was as well and didn't look at her last week too when she had the hat trick. I'm going to go with Cora as well like eight goals in this year's campaign has been tremendous and as you said already there's still a chance they could sneak through yeah 100% and I, I definitely agree she's definitely somebody that deserves the recognition for her uh, performances this year and I think it was probably up there with another moment of the week her tackle Laid on in that game was fantastic. Yeah, Jesus, it was something that you could watch over again. Um, but like you said, just standing up when she's needed to kind of help that team get the win to keep them in the competition. So, uh, yeah, well deserved. A tackle as well up on social media. Do check it out. Cora coming from the blind side pretty much, but just <laughs> positioned the hand perfectly. It wasn't dangerous. It was tough. And that's exactly what we want to see from our footballers in AFL. So uh, Joanne Doolan's pick for this week is Sinead Goldrick from Dublin and from the Melbourne Demons. Darren Kelly's pick is Cora Staunton from Mayo and the Greater Western Sydney Giants. Let's move on to next week. We've already been touching on our two featured games. Let's go into them in more detail. And we do them in Cranlon logical order now uh, actually first Joanne I'll actually get the prediction of the Friday night game because he's going to set the tone for the weekend uh, the Western Bulldogs are still in the mix they need a big result but they're playing a Richmond team that you could see are in form and would definitely have a boost from beating the Eagles yeah exactly I think uh, I think we had discussed in previous weeks how 
they're starting to show they have like I said a, a lot of uh, big individual players and they're starting to kind of gel that way a bit better and kind of showing the potential the club has and I suppose like I said although it's maybe classes the B final they did stand up and they, uh, they did kind of show the class that they had against West Coast maybe that momentum will kind of help them into into this game as uh, Bulldogs are coming off three losses so it's still there. I know Richmond may have nothing to play for, but I don't think they're going to go in and let the Bulldogs kind of walk over them. Um, you have the likes of Ellie Blackburn, you know, Izzy Huntington, Bonnie too good, some girls, some fantastic players for the Bulldogs as well. So I definitely wouldn't rule them out uh, just yet. But like you said, at least we'll find out early this weekend. So who are you going for, Bulldogs in Richmond? I'm probably going to go Bulldogs. I do think they will pull it out, yeah. You're, you're keeping them in the mix. You're adding to the yeah, intrigue. Yeah. That's yeah. at 10 past six on Friday. It's not one of our featured games, but it is probably the third most important game if you take the ranking that we're doing them. So let's move to Saturday. In the game, the course, that could define it all. The North Melbourne Kangaroos against the Fremantle Dockers. Any result for the Kangaroos, win or draw, and they are into the playoffs. But of course, while we're talking about the top six, Joanne, as well, there's so much else going on. There's the top two spots, which go straight into the semifinals. And at home advantage and the preliminary finals I should call them by what they're called and the Fremantle Dockers are very much in the mix for one of those two spots Yeah exactly um, as as much as the teams that are safe the top five teams at the minute there is still a lot to play for and like you said that home advantage can make a massive difference you know it's not like like here where you're travelling an hour down the road you know it could be a flight journey away and your home crowd, uh, a lot of factors come into it and uh, there's a lot of reasons why you still want to finish uh, on top of the ladder. Um, and like you said, and we've talked about before about Freya's tenacity and just they're never let up, you know, again, like roaring in girls' faces when they score, different things like that, that you know they're definitely not going to be a team to walk over just because they're, they're already uh, in the top five. But I think, I suppose, even if you look at the games from last week, I think they're a girl that's contending for best and fairest at uh, Kyra Bowers you know her ban was lifted uh, very luckily and she's able to play this weekend where you see you can compare that to Jenna uh, Brunton for the Kangaroos who her ban didn't get lifted and she was best on ground for them last week uh, even out of the two teams so it's massive impact for them teams but again you'd still be looking at Kangaroos to try and pull something out of the bag to kind of hold there that that is sixth position but again it's hard it's hard to know yeah it's a big one too with Kira Bowers because it was her second offence this year so she didn't get reprimand she did get a 400 uh, d- dollar fine for her challenge on Eden Sanker while Jenna Bruton uh, rough conduct against Shannon Campbell and she's missing out as well and um, like Fremantle want to bounce back from the loss they certainly don't look like, look like a team that like to lose two games in a row so off the field in the, the committee room uh, big decisions that could influence this contest have been made yeah, exactly. And Melbourne have very good players around the middle of the field and I think they're rocked at all that actually uh, was tackled to the ground. Is a fantastic player and can kangaroos match uh, the, the Frios midfielders and I suppose all over the field, obviously. But they're that type of team that's not going to let up. They're not going to, I suppose, let the kangaroos. But I feel like these are two very feisty teams and I think uh, Emma Kearney is, is definitely a team and a leader that's not going to let our team get bullied around uh, by the Frio girls. So I have a notion it's going to be very fiery and very uh, intense game. And like you said, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be something to be reckoned with uh, for the for the talent of the rest of the weekend. It's one of those games that would tempt you to stay up late on Saturday yeah. night. It's on a ton of past two, or Friday night, I should say. It's on a ton of two in the morning. Just going back to our conversation about the top two as well, because we're saying it's all about jockeying for position. And of course, as you touched on, they could go coast to coast. If Fremantle lost this game, they could drop to fifth or sixth in the ladder, which could mean two away matches to make a grand final while the other point as well is that because the games are week to week a week off for the top two teams will be just as good as a match now because no doubt there's a lot of sore bodies and two of the six teams will be off next week yeah 100% like I think that's probably one of the the biggest things that it was hard to get used to over there how the quick turnover and especially for such a physical sport you know it's so easy to get injured and any opportunity to let the girls rest uh, and I suppose there's, there was no easy games this year to, I suppose, 
play a weaker team that you can rest your girls a wee bit more. But it's definitely something that teams will be will be kind of edging out to try and get the best. Uh, like you said, there's nothing still guaranteed. Um, there's still a few places that could be up for grabs. Uh, the likes of Collingwood and Brisbane are still on the same points. And like you said, whatever way their game goes this weekend to throw that off. So it's definitely, definitely exciting. And uh, yeah, there's still, I know we're focusing, I suppose, on that sixth spot, but there's still a lot to be told uh, from this weekend. As you mentioned, in Adelaide as well, I think of a good um, percentage too, and they'll be looking for that too. And obviously, which got us um, for likes of Aileen Gilroy and like you mentioned, Emma Carney too, Jess Stuff, and they're like big players too from Kangaroos, they'll want to bounce back from a loss as well. So while both teams can be fiery, it can be very competitive too, they both have a point to prove, which gives this game that extra bit of a bite in it that it would naturally have had anyway, regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, exactly. And I think as as I touched on, Kangaroos are, uh, I know we've been playing from them in the challenge last year. They're very fiery. And if one girl's in, they're all in, you know, they're they're a good team kind of together. And I suppose sometimes it, we've seen previously this year that they, they get very open at the back um, where teams have kind of punished them previously, but they seem to have kind of Tried a wee bit to kind of close that down a bit and to have some very good forwards up there. But as long as kind of Frio doesn't have them matched up um, too good, then I think Kangaroos will definitely get an edge out on them. But I think like it's a very, very tough, tough game to call. I'm even struggling even now and changing my mind every every two minutes as I talk to you. <laughs> so now I put the gun to your head. Kangaroos <laughs> or Dockers? I'm gonna go. I uh, I want to, for Ailing's sake. I'm gonna go with the kangaroos. I think they they'll have to put it out of the bag to get that sixth place. So they're not gonna forgive you in Carlton for that prediction, Joanne. <laughs> God knows, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll not let me. Let me so. Down now. Joanne's prediction is the Kangaroos will get through that sixth spot and Fremantle will have to go through the scenic route for a grand final. Let's say you're wrong. Mm-hmm. We get to Sunday, ten past six in the morning. Greater Western Sydney Giants now, they've only 71.6%, but there's still a chance against Carlton that could sniff. We've talked about Carlton sitting there the whole time. I thought they were gone, but they're still mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And the door could open up on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. I was kind of similar to yourself. They were kind of going in lulls, like going uh, a wee bit of a dark horse and then kind of just looking as if no way they're, they're not going to pull this back and, and look at the position they're in. There's still an opportunity for them. Like, I suppose after this weekend, yes, there's different home advantage, but you could still end up winning the preliminaries if, even if you're in sixth place. So I'd say they'll be looking at it in, in that kind of point of view. So after a very good good win over the Suns last weekend like you have girls on fire like the Dorsey Vesio you know these are real leaders that when you see them play well it kind of ripple effect through the rest of the team and I definitely think that they'll probably learn from the mistakes and that they'll not be going in complacent to the Giants like on paper I suppose you would be saying that they should beat them and especially I suppose watching the game between uh, GWS and g last week you'd be, you'd be fairly confident but again like you said this competition has been proven to be very surprising at times and I wouldn't rule out GWS just yet, but I definitely think that Carlton will be putting their money down regardless of the result on Saturday, yeah. It's like you, you said there, like form-wise, like Carlton, 87 points, 13 goals, nine behind, behind a record for themselves. Darcy Fessio scoring five goals, Brian Moody also doing very well too. Like it's easy to, to pick them, but we, of course, we've questioned the Giants before. Then they step up with a big performance as well. They've nothing to lose and they'll have a lot to learn from, you know, as uh, Alicia Evans described it, a frustrating experience against Geelong. Yeah, and I suppose I've touched on it before about, when, you know, when you play teams that are that way, but weaker, it's kind of hard sometimes to get that momentum up and kind of push past that. Um, but I suppose when you look at Carlton, you know, it's it's definitely able to be done. But personal opinion, I kind of watching the Giants and I know it was different uh, conditions and things like that. They, they did look tired. They looked out in their feet the last while, whereas you kind of seen the likes of Carlton towards the, towards the finish that they were, I suppose, just reaping the rewards of I suppose being on form and doing well and I suppose they'll be looking to kind of bring that into the training this week and keep that momentum rolling over and just even knowing from playing with a few of the girls themselves I know that they'll definitely not want to see 
the game changed this weekend. The likes of Brooke Walker back. I've mentioned her before. She's a fantastic forward. And even that kind of settling the, the team a wee bit more, knowing that to have them experienced players back and like maybe Taylor Harris and them ones just kind of settling it a wee bit more that I think they'll get the experience to get over uh, GWS this weekend. Carl didn't get the results. Obviously, we're not going to know until Sunday what they need to do. And then again, we'll be probably changing it as the game goes on. Yeah. Uh, you're predicting Carlton. Can they win by the 30, 40 points that's at the moment? And I am only guessing they might need to win by. They might need to win by that much as well if the Kangaroos lose. But you get the feeling they're going to have to put up a big score. Yeah, exactly. I think, like you said, it doesn't matter. I suppose if Kangaroos lose, it's not they're still on the same points. Mm. even if Carlton do win. So like you said, it's about getting that, I suppose, percentage difference. And the one kind of issue, I suppose, looking at that and even looking at Sun, Sun's probably had, I think, one of our top three scores against teams this whole year, and that was against Carlton. So you'd be kind of wary now of the potential of the GWS forwards, you'd think would be a lot stronger than the Suns forwards. So if Carlton can manage to kind of keep them... GWS forwards from punishing them then maybe it is achievable but again it's probably the one downfall of Carlton's performance that they are they've conceived quite a lot and their forwards kind of do open up or kind of are caught sleeping that way a bit more than they probably would like but again yeah like you said trying to get the percentage up I would say that Kangaroos would be kind of hopeful that they, they might be able to do enough even if they get a loss they kind of keep that percentage a way bit higher than them yeah, I'm guessing a 30-point swing between the two games. But then again, as you just touched on there, if, if Sydney gets scores, it's nearly for every goal uh, Sydney gets. Carlton have to have probably eight or nine points as well. Yeah. So it, it's something we'll work out if it's all to play for on Sunday. So we have Bulldogs, Kangaroos, Carlton all expected to get the wins. And that would mean the Kangaroos qualify. We'll try and work out who we think the top two will be in a moment. Let's get your predictions in the other four games first. And let's start with the game that will tell an awful lot on Saturday. 10 past 4 a.m. Melbourne Demons against the Brisbane Lions. Yeah, definitely another massive game. Um, but I suppose Brisbane, four wins in a row, they're looking in fine tune at the minute and they'll be looking to kind of nail that kind of top spot. Like you said, to get that home advantage, get in front of the crowds. I know they're probably one of the teams that do have to travel a lot more than the rest of them. So I'd say that's something that they'll be pushing for. But again, is, is it something that, like similar to Gaelic? Do you be afraid of kind of showing your whole hand, you know, before the final series. But look, a week off to them could be massive. So uh, I would say I'd probably go with Brisbane. I think they're just looking unstoppable at the minute, yeah. So Brisbane to get the nod there and that would secure them a top two spot. Let's get the wooden spoon game out of the way. Disappointing mm-hmm. year for Gold Coast and Geelong. Mm-hmm. One of them will get their first win of the season. In a way, it's like a, C- it's like a plate final, but an important one yeah. to finish off in a high for them. Yeah, exactly. I'd say that both teams probably don't want to go through the whole season without having even one win. Um, although looking at G Long, even watching them, like I think even their body language, some they didn't even nearly celebrate when they got a score last week. You know, so it's and I know it'd be hard, especially if you if you are getting hammered. But uh, I just feel like the Suns have that wee bit more, I suppose, enthusiasm, even for the circumstances that uh, I would say Suns might edge this one over G Long. Suns get the nod there. So now on to Sunday, 2.40 a.m. Of course, they're a bit different in Ireland because the clock's going forward. Adelaide Crows against Collingwood. Again, another big one. Uh, Adelaide probably wanting to kind of get that top spot for the for the uh, semis, as we would call them. But again, Collingwood after losing last... Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm confusing myself now. After a good win, sorry, at the weekend, I'd say they want that momentum up after breaking the streak of the wins. But... I would imagine Collingwood would be well able to beat uh, Adelaide at the minute. So Collingwood, if they get that, they'll get guaranteed them a top two spot as well. So uh, Joanne's prediction is Brisbane and Collingwood will go into the, the the preliminary finals where the Demons, the Kangaroos, the Crows and, um, who am I forgetting, the Dockers will play yeah. off in the uh, preliminary semi-finals. Final game, West Coast Eagles against St Kilda. Kilda Flair did the with the start. West Coast probably didn't do as well as we hoped they would have. But I do think that Richmond are a good team as well and St Kilda have just kind of went downhill altogether. So uh, I would like to see 
West Coast get another win on the board, but again, Ash Mack, I think, could be out. Maybe, you know, she got a, a nasty injury in the last game that we've seen that had her coming off earlier. So maybe if she's back as well, that they'll put one over on them. But again, it's probably hard to say, but I'll, I'll predict West Coast for that one, actually, yeah. And that was for Man All Ireland winner and ex Carton player Joanne Doonan previewing the seven matches taking place this weekend in the AFL Women's Series. It's the final round of group games. We know five of the qualifiers as we discussed, and I'll give you the fixtures in a moment. One bit of news we do have that we didn't have when we recorded the interview is sadly Sinead Goldrick uh, from Dublin and Melbourne Demons is out for the rest of the season after the injury she picked up in last week's win over Fremantle Dockers. A massive blow for Sinead especially as she's been nominated as a player of the week here on Sports Stars. We wish Sinead the very very best of luck in her recovery and well disappointed we are for her that she won't play for Melbourne again this season. We certainly hope she'll be back in, in the Dublin colours in the near future as well. Let's look at the fixtures this weekend, starting with uh, tomorrow, Friday, 6.10am in the morning, the Western Bulldogs at home against the Richmond Tigers. Um, that's, we'll have updates on that here on Sportstars. Then Triple Header on Saturday, one of our featured games, the North Melbourne Kangaroos versus the Fremantle Dockers. That's at 2.10am. If the Kangaroos get anything out of the game, they take the last spot in the playoffs and it's all about deciding the numbers 1-6. to six. Melbourne Demons take on the Brisbane Lions at 10 for 10 a.m. Brisbane Lions in pole position to be one of the two as preliminary finalists that are guaranteed after this round. And then the wooden spoon match at 10, 6 10 a.m. Gold Coast Suns versus the Geelong Cats. On Sunday, Adelaide Crows take on Collingwood at 2.40 a.m. Times are different on Sunday this week as the clocks are going forward in Ireland. A result for Collingwood will guarantee them a place in a preliminary final at home. A match that could be a dead rubber or could be a winner takes all. Greater Western Sydney Giants versus Carlton. That's at 6.10am on Sunday. We've already featured that earlier on. And the final game, West Coast Eagles versus St Kilda. That's at 8.10am on Sunday. We'll be giving updates on those two games. And just to let you know as well, on TG Carr, the two matches they'll be shown are on Saturday, it'll be the North Melbourne Kangaroos versus Fremantle Dockers. And Sunday, the Adelaide Crows versus Colin Wood. So that's our AFL wrap up for this week. Also, we'd like to thank our guest earlier on, uh, Vicky Wall from Mead, and of course Joanne Doonan from Forman and X Carlton, who is with us there. That's the end of the show. We've social media updates over the weekend. We'll be back next week with the Fair Green and Sports Dance Football. And if you missed the Fair Green this week, check it out. Marie Crotty, Waterford football legend, was our guest. And a pioneer for Waterford football, has coached at the age of even 16 and has played as well. And it's a very, very fascinating interview and I hope you enjoy it. But that was it. I'd like to thank Vicky Wall and Joanne Doonan again. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Darren Kelly and this was Sports Dads Football.